The first time you met, you knocked on the door of Cato's bungalow. This is hours after the murder, after you came from the crime scene on Bundy. You knew Nicole was dead. There was another victim. You didn't know who did it. You go to OJ's house. This is the first person to use, that you see. Did you have to consider that he could be a suspect when you knocked on that door? Hi, everybody. Welcome to One Degree of Scandalous. I'm Tom Zenner, my co-host, Cato Kalin, right over here across the table. Good and are we you. lucky today, ladies and gentlemen, we have the one and only, the most legendary LAPD detective who's been in the middle of the biggest cases in LA history, including, of course, the O.J. Simpson saga, which we're going to get into today. This is his first chance to really talk about, you know, a lot about the O.J. case since O.J. died last week. So, Tom, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to have you here. Awesome. Yeah. And in studio. So thank you for doing that. And, you know, let me get right into it because, you know, you two go way back 30 years which is fascinating. The first time you met, you knocked on the door of Cato's bungalow. This is hours after the murder, after you came from the crime scene on Bundy. You knew Nicole was dead. There was another victim. You didn't know who did it. You go to OJ's house. This is the first person to use, that you see. Did you have to consider that he could be a suspect when you knocked on that door? Sure. When you, uh, <clears throat> under these types of situations, you're like two miles away from where this happened as the crow flies. And you don't know what you have. We went to the front door. There's a light on, uh, but we, nobody's answering. We've got a couple of cars in the driveway. Something's going on. Somebody's in there, but nobody's answering. So in my mind, after leaving a crime scene with two victims, bloody victims, O.J. Simpson lives here. There's talk that this is his estranged wife. Is he inside in the same type of condition? Is he alive or dead? because nobody's responding to the front door. We've got a phone line that goes into the house. Nobody's picking up the phone. So we're, we're saying, hey, we got a problem here. Mm -hmm. That's where the big contest came in about should they go over the fence, should they go over the wall? No, we could have gone to breakfast. No, of course not. There's a possibility you've got another victim inside the house and it might be O.J. Simpson. Mm -hmm. So we had to get in there. Yeah. So we went over the wall, through the gate, Front door, nobody's answering, so we go around the back, obviously, and we see, I believe, like three bungalows. And so we started knocking on doors, and uh, the first uh, first one, I believe, was Cato, yeah. and Simpson's daughter, Arnell, was in another one. So we, uh, Furman, I think, knocked on Cato's door first, yeah. and I knocked on Arnell's. And they both came, came out about the same time. Arnell, they came out first. Yeah, I, I, all, I remember in being in, it's sort of a haze, and I hear I'm not, the phone is not part of his phone is not connected, but I can hear through a wall. I kept thinking, am I dreaming? I hear this. You guys must have kept calling and calling and ringing. I'm going, is this part of a dream? And then there's knocks at my door, and when I did open it. First, I was in a haze. I mean, yeah. you, you saw oh, yeah. me when I was. I, I yeah. have no idea what's going on. I didn't even ask who you guys were. There was four, four, yeah. and I remember four. And I said, "Come on in," and it was yeah. uh, Phil Vanetter, yourself, uh, Detective Phillips. I remember what that name? Yeah. And uh, Furman. Yeah. And uh, you, you all came in my room, and um, uh, he, Furman, had asked me, "What, what did you wear last night?" Before anything else, I, what did you wear last? I showed him my clothes were hanging in a chair. He goes, "Where are your shoes?" And I think you were in there. You guys looked at the bottom yeah. of my shoes, and then you, they yeah. took a, a flashlight, right? And I think you, what do you call the test that you? It was sort of a nystagmus test huh. to see if your eyeballs would jump a little bit. In other words, to see if you were the influence of narcotics or something. And this is 4.30 what? or 5 in the morning. The last I think, thing I think you it's would at 5, 5.30. You know, I'm yeah. not going to start yeah. double, you know, asking questions. But that was, we didn't need to do that. Right. Because right. this is like 5, as fact, it was 5, 10 in the morning. You were obviously half asleep. I don't know why Furman did that, quite frankly, but oh. he did. So it's, I did pass that test, right? Yeah, you made it. Oh. You, you passed that one. I don't know about the others that followed, but well, you got that one. He knows a guilty man when he sees one. You looked innocent, Cato. I was. I was. It thank was God. five in the morning or so, so my yeah. eyes were probably red. Hey, anyway. thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, this is going to be a fascinating hour. Um, Tom's going to be sharing so much about evidence, the evidence that he and his partners uncovered for this trial, for this case that was never used. And you're going to hear the backstory of why. You're going to hear details about it, including what OJ was dumping in the airport. Um, what happened when Tom and his team disassembled the Bronco? I mean, there's just so many fascinating things we're going to get here. So if you like the show, make sure you subscribe. Give us a like right here. And uh, it's going to be a fascinating episode. So buckle up. And, and Tom, we'll get back into it because... 
you know, all this stuff is fresh. Little did you know that both of your lives are changed instantly. You were already a very famous detective at that point because of the past cases that you were involved in. But was the was the scene at Bundy about as horrific as you've seen as a detective at that point? As a detective, uh, yeah, it was. Uh, uh, when anytime you have a knife attack, there's a lot of blood, obviously, and when there's more than one victim. But Nicole uh, was nearly decapitated, so that shows some a little more than this is. This isn't just the robbery or a narcotics deal gone wrong. This has a lot more to do with uh, something that's very personal. Yeah, and so that's that's what strikes you first, and then the number of wounds. Uh, the defensive wounds on both. We knew there was a struggle. That was very obvious. And the whole scene, I could, it looked very involved, but it probably could have been over in 15 or 20 seconds. Hmm. Cato, did you ask them, did you know there was a murder? Did you know Nicole no. was dead at this point? No, I knew, I knew nothing. Uh, they, uh, of course, they didn't tell me anything. And um, then at one point, uh, 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 Tom said to me, uh, you and Arnell go into the main house. And they, I followed all the detectives into the main house. And the main house, we sat on a couch. We still didn't know anything going on. Crazy. Well, we didn't know if Simpson might have been in there as a victim, yeah. like I said earlier. And this is where Arnell initially told us, he, she thought that he was in the house. Uh, I said, where's your dad? And he, she said something to the effect, well, he's in the house, isn't he? At that point, I think we, we might have a problem. And the back door was locked. And so I said, do you have a key? She said, sure, I've got a key. So she went and got the key, and she sticks the key in, and she's opening the door. I said, step back, let us go in first, because I didn't know what we were going to find. Mm -hmm. And we went in, and we checked the maid's area, because the maid was supposed to be there. She took the night off. She wasn't in there. Her room was all made up, and there was no evidence of anything else. And that's when we found out that through Cato that he'd taken off to Chicago. Chicago, which is unbelievable. Now, as a detective, does that change your thoughts at all? Like, oh, he had nothing to do with this? I mean, without knowing the timeline at that point, what goes through your mind as a seasoned detective when you find out he's in Chicago, these murders happened about six hours ago, six or seven hours ago? Yeah, that's fine. But again, you don't know until you ask. You talk to the people, and then you go back and you talk to them again. Most cases, when you have a, a, a witness who's involved, you don't have one or two interviews. You might go back for a dozen interviews to see if things make sense, more or less, and to see if they corroborate what they've said earlier. Many times, if you have a witness who's not being entirely truthful with you, they'll, uh, they'll change their story, they'll add a little bit to it, they'll take a little bit out. You're looking for consistency, so you're going to go back and talk to these people several times over. Cato, okay, these aren't mall cops. I mean, it had to be intimidating no. as hell, right? Yeah. Just because these are forceful individuals, serious business, and they just came from a crime scene with two horrible murder victims, right? And yeah. You, and, and you had to be freaking out. Well, I, I, I didn't know what was going on. So as far, as far as freaking out, I knew something was seriously wrong. I did, had no idea there was murder involved. I knew nothing about uh, Nicole because you were at the Rockingham. So I just... I just, I, we just sat on a couch and you were doing your, I, I think your interviews and, and looking at things. And I, we're going to get right back to this. But the thing that I, I was telling Tom last week, you know, so many things come into your mind. I'm sure they do. That gets refreshed again because you bring it up. And you, when you bring it up, you go, oh, yeah, that's right. I mean, the, the fact of uh, coming in the eye test. And then I just remember after um, you had uh, uh, escorted me out, someone had escorted me out. I just remember. It's one of these nightmares. There, it's a thought that I think about probably every other day. It said, "Watch your feet when you walk out. For, watch out for the blood stains." Mm. And I just looked down, and he had one of those uh, the flooring that had those little uh, wooden pegs, but between the pegs there were blood droplets. And then I, I just went, you know, you sort of get that spine, the tingling up your spine when you're walking out. But I'll never forget that when I walked out. And so I looked around and I saw, I watched my step and then I was escorted out by a, um, a street policeman. Yeah. What did you think the blood was? I, at that point, yeah. I thought that was probably OJ's blood. Why? Because that was his house. It was in inside his house. It's interesting about the blood he's talking about when the sun came up. It was more evident that there were blood, blood tails. And the tail of the blood is in the front. Because when a blood droplet strikes the surface, it splatters forward and it elongates. So the tail is towards the direction that the person 
the uh, where the blood is coming from is walking. And so they all this blood tailed from the rear of the Bronco through the Rockingham gate up the driveway and tailed right into the house. So whoever left that blood was walking from the Bronco up the up the walk, walkway up the driveway and into the house. And it was the only part I saw was in the kitchen. So continued, you're saying, from the kitchen, it, it continued. continued right into the house. In fact, later we even found some upstairs in the uh, in the bathroom. You know, it's it's mind boggling how your mind works as a seasoned <laughs> detective and yeah. how you're five steps ahead and you're looking at things on the ground that no one would notice. You take the lead, lead detective in this case. How do you even prioritize what you do next? Was your first thought, we got to get Simpson back here. We got to get him out of Chicago. We got to get a hold of him and, and, and get him to fly back here ASAP. Was that your job? Uh, yeah. Well, actually, we called him uh, when Cato mentioned they were inside with Arnell. We called from the, from the uh, phone and I got him on the phone. I think uh, Phillips called, called him first. And told him that his uh, his wife had passed on. He didn't say how or anything else. And uh, he said, "We well, you need to get back here. He called the house after that, and I answered it and spoke with him. He didn't ask about the kids, which surprised me. Uh, he didn't say anything more about any details other than he's got the next plane coming in, roughly when he would be there. He's got a lift from the airport. He'll come to the home, this type of thing. It was not a suspect, but we obviously, you don't look for suspects, you look for information. Uh, something will come, something will break, but you need to speak to the people in the middle of all of this. Once we found out that he was there the night before, from Cato principally, uh, there was the possibility that he was around during the time of the murders. So obviously we want to speak to him and the sooner the better. And again, why wouldn't you ask about your kids? Right. You know, I, I have a question about this. If, just because of the way you're telling me this, isn't that first phone call, the first phone call you do to OJ, isn't that like the most important phone call? And you guys can't tape it, correct? It just has to go on wording because how important would that have been, been as evidence of taping it that he didn't ask about the kids? Yeah, that's correct. Now put yourself in that position. If someone calls you in the middle of the night and tells you that uh, your spouse has been, been killed, and what are you gonna think? You got two kids at home, okay? Right. And they're supposed to be asleep. What's your first thought? I've got kids and grandkids. I don't know what my first thought is. Where are the right. kids? Exactly. Where are they? Are they okay? I mean, that was just blew us away. And that was the first thing we're looking mm -hmm. at each other. I said, sometimes you don't have to explain anything. You just a glance will tell you something's not right here. Yeah. And the red flags yeah. started at yeah, that right. moment. And then it could have been a car accident, right? Oh, well, yeah. And then yeah. were the kids in the car? I mean, that is. And yeah. to think that he knew the kids lived with her. And we're in the yeah. house, and that yeah. they could see that in the morning, right. sure. depending on when they woke up and went outside or whatever. Yeah. I just again, that doesn't make him a suspect at the time, but you remember these things. Mm -hmm. And then you get him back. So then it's Monday, right? Yeah. He flies back, and the circus has already started. Sure. Media everywhere. Where did you meet him? Where did you talk to him first? Well, he came back to the house uh, directly, back to the house with a couple of people that he knew. Uh, a lawyer, Frank Kardashian, was with him. And uh, they came back to the house, and Phil was there. Now, I had left and gone back to Bundy to handle that crime scene investigation. Once the blood was found in Rockingham, we had to get a warrant. You can't just go in. Uh, you have to get a warrant. And so Phil went to get the warrant, check in with the district attorney's office, and I would handle the crime scene at Bundy. And meanwhile, we... Removed everybody from Rockingham. We didn't want anybody in, the, in there because it was essentially an extension of the crime scene. Yeah, and Cato, how about the rest of the day for you? Well, I, I went to the police station. Uh, I think it was Santa Monica, and I stayed there for at l it had to be at least eight hours. And I just, I sat in, I, I think it probably was an interrogation room. I, I, everybody was really nice to me, but I sat there, and then they took a break. I could go to the bathroom, and then they offered me lunch. And it was, I still in nothing. I was in limbo, basically. Yeah. With a, I had no idea what's going on. And um, uh, I know that uh, the one thing I do remember, um, it's probably a very powerful impact on you, is that you didn't want the media to know before anybody else. So you had to make the phone call to the Brown family. And that's yeah. when I knew that Nicole was uh, had been murdered. Yeah, I, had to I make overheard that. it. I made the call actually from Rockingham before I left. And because of the media, we knew that the media was going to be all over this. 
let's face it, they have more resources than we do. They have more people. They can move around a lot quicker. They don't need a search warrant. They're going to do what they're going to do. Yeah. And it didn't take long for them to do that. And I just am grateful that I did get a hold of them. But I've made death notifications before, and you don't want to do that. Sometimes you got to do something that you really don't want to. If I had not done that, it would just have made the whole situation much more worse. Well, that's got to be one of the worst parts of your job. And then when you mention the media, think about it. This is L.A. You've got seven TV stations that do news. You've got newspapers. And then you got bureaus for all the big networks. And then you got hard copy. you got all those those shows like that. And everybody's immediately on this. And it's just a, a frenzy. You know, it, this is what Cato and I do every week. So if you're new to the channel, you're new to the show, it's One Degree of Scandalous. We have great guests every single week, like Tom Lang today, which is fascinating. So give us a like and make sure you subscribe because you want to get this content every single week. And, and, and we're going to be talking about some evidence that a lot of people don't know about, including a knife that O.J. purchased about three weeks before the murder and a disguise that he purchased three weeks before the murder that they found receipts on. So we're going to get into all of that today on this show. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask one question about it because Tom had mentioned how the media, how, how fast they can come uh, and be at a scene. Is, is it like the movies, Tom, where uh, there is a, uh, a radio call and someone at home has a police radio? They can find out. They can, they can hear murder at Bundy. And they give the address. Is that how? It, and people can. Oh, sure. sh that's it, right? Yeah, unless it's on a uh, you know a special frequency that just in, internally that you talk to other people. Let's face it; they have folks out there too, and the the media, as any reporter will tell you, that uh, many times their stories depend upon informants of some type or another. Right. But they know what's going on. They have ears. They have eyes, and they got money to spend, and the and people to spend it on. And many times they know a lot more than we do because I couldn't tell you where the Browns lived. They could. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They have access to the resources. Meanwhile, we're in the field trying to keep a lid on things. You don't want evidence that you have, like at a murder scene, exposed because it could affect your case one way or the right. other. You're trying to protect that evidence. Yeah. And then another thing that affects you is the fact that there's so much competition in the media that one erroneous story gets out. Everybody runs with it. Right. That then becomes fact almost, or that's right. then takes on a life of its own, which people believe. So you're, you're battling that as well. And that Unbe happened here. Unbelievably right. hard job for you. And especially when you consider that Marsha Clark didn't really, as smart as she was, you've told us that she's a smart attorney. She's a smart, competent prosecutor. But, man, she, she treated you like you could only hurt her case, LAPD, right? I mean, you did you feel you were fighting a battle from the get-go? Not from the get-go, but over a period of time, you realize once we got into trial that we were actually on trial in a lot of respects. Mm -hmm. I mentioned this another time. I've mentioned it several times. I was on the stand for eight days. I had more problems with Marsha's direct than Johnny Cochran's cross. It's as simple as that. Uh, for reasons that we could get into, uh, I figured out why, what's going on here. It didn't take long that they didn't want cops on the stand introducing evidence because this jury was not pro-police, pro-LAPD. Mm -hmm. This is after the Rodney King riots. The whole Rodney King thing was like two years old. Mm -hmm. And this was the, what this jury was more interested in than someone uh, on trial for murder. So we essentially were on trial and she didn't really do a whole lot about that. Yeah. You're handcuffed. You're handcuffed. Now, I mean, basically, you can't really do your job. In some respects, because there was only two people that got a gag order in this entire case, me and my partner. Everybody else, the defense, three times a day, they'd be in front of the medias attacking evidence before it had been produced in court. Uh, the, the prosecution could say what they wanted, but the two cops, mm -hmm. we were gagged. You know, yeah. both of you guys are from Milwaukee, which is unbelievable coincidence. Right. And Cato, think about this, because I'm going to ask Tom this question, and you can think about what might be uh, your number one choice here. But, you know, it's all about evidence, Tom. And, and you spent the better part of, what, five, six months gathering evidence. And maybe even during the trial, you were still getting yep. evidence. So much of it wasn't used. Is there one piece? Now, to me, I will say the cut finger for OJ. You come back from Chicago without a real story or an alibi for that cut, and it's still bleeding, I think you've yep. said in the past. That, to me, is the number one thing. When you saw that cut, what were you thinking? Well, in the back of my mind, he's got to be a possible suspect. I mean, it's still bleeding. You go back. This was when we interviewed him. It was about 13 hours after the murders that occurred. We feel that it probably went down about 1235 or so. I'm sorry, 1035 or so at night. 
And so this is early the next afternoon, still bleeding. He doesn't even have a Band-Aid on it. You want to make a record of that on the tape that we're, we're doing. So I mentioned something. I said, I see your fingers bleeding. Maybe we can get a Band-Aid for that or something. And he just said, no, that's okay. It's fine. So we're looking at each other, and, you know, maybe he's moved up a notch as a possible suspect. But you can't jump to, jump to conclusions here before you got the full story. And in that short interview, and it was a short interview for a reason, there were like a dozen inconsistencies in that short interview, three different stories during the 32 minutes about how he cut his finger. Um, and so we have to look a little closer at that. 32 was his number. Are you just saying that because yeah. of that? No, it's 30. Well, 30. Might have been Good 33. Catch. I'm going to say 32. <laughs> I, I like that. You know, this is Hollywood. Uh, it's Hollywood. He goes, we'll stop at 32. Yeah. That's, but but here, here's a Immediately, I become a detective when, when Tom talks. I'm thinking there's a cut on his finger. No one ever said if the gloves, did it have a slit in that, that finger? Did the glove actually have a cut hole in it? Okay, good question. Yeah. There are two gloves, right hand, left hand. Correct. Okay, the left hand here. The right hand glove is at, is at uh, Rockingham. Left hand glove is at the scene. It did have some, but you can't line up the, the actual... I know what you're getting at. Yeah. Uh, there were some cuts, but they wouldn't match up with the, the, the hand. That having been said, we believe that he lost the glove during a struggle. Mm -hmm. And the glove where it was found, the left glove, was found at the scene along with the other evidence right in the middle of the two bodies. Wow. So we think the glove obviously uh, went off before, before the cut. Because the other glove, the Rockingham, of course, had blood of both victims mm -hmm. and him. And, but this one did not, you couldn't say that cut was went through the glove because the glove was sure, off correct. already. And that's a great question because yeah. there had to be a struggle. I mean, Ron Goldman is a big guy yeah. who was trained in martial arts, right? I mean, yeah. he came about this and saw something happening and obviously the aftermath of whatever happened to Nicole and there obviously was a struggle, right? You can yeah. tell by the blood and everything. Well, that and the, the wounds, the defensive wounds in both of the victims and uh, Ron Goldman's hands were all uh, bruised up. So he went at it uh, pretty good. But again, we've had reenactments of this, and the whole thing probably didn't last 20 seconds. Uh, but he was slight. He had four fatal wounds. Uh, that's Goldman. And, and Nicole, of course, uh, her throat was slashed, and nearly she was nearly decapitated after she was struck in the rear of the head. You know, you and I have discussed this too, Tom, off, off camera, the fact that O.J. was a voyeur, right? Nicole used to live at Gretna Green, where Cato mm -hmm. lived with her, and neighbors would report that O.J. would show up and look in the window. He did that yeah. with a mask on. So you knew that about him. What's your hunch? Do you think that he went there that night to kill Nicole? I don't know that he went there that particular night. But again, we knew that for months he'd been, been following her. There was a, a couple of people who said we also think that Nicole was aware of that, that she'd been followed when she was driving. Uh, this is a June night. He's got wearing leather gloves and a, and a, a, a knit cap. Uh, it's not like it was 40 degrees out. It was a warm evening, fairly warm evening. Um, why would you be there to begin with, especially when you were leaving town that night? Now, that may have had something to do with it. Maybe he thought it through. I don't know. I think he was probably ticked off uh, when Ron Goldman showed up. That's when he heard a witness who was across the street he heard someone who he later said he thought it was O.J. yelling, hey, 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 or something to that effect, and the clanging of a gate, which was where the struggle occurred. Um, I, I can't say that he went there intentionally to do it because uh, I don't think he expected Goldman to be there, but I think that might have might have teed him off. Well, he, he kind of kind of wrote that book, If I Did It, and he yeah. gives his description of how he did it. Yeah. I mean, it's a, you know, he's saying in that book of, uh, and, oh. and may, maybe that's, you know, being a detective, you probably looked at that and said, well, these are... Well, yeah, I mean, with him, it's just pure arrogance. I mean, he is a sociopath, no doubt. I'm not a psychologist, but I've dealt with sociopaths. I can tell you what one is. And American public, there's like four and a half million social social uh, so people who, uh, who have those types of problems in this country. They're not all serial killers, Okay. There's a lot of politicians who happen to be sociopathic, you know, and a, lot, a lot of other people with big names are, and some of them can, most of them can control it. 
but here you can look outside now and say it's dark. You know, it's no, it's not. It's very bright, sun, sunny day today. That's what a sociopath is being told denial and look you right in the eye and say no. Well, he certainly had an affinity for knives, right? If he didn't yeah. go there to kill her that night, he had a knife in the car in the Bronco. Uh, he was on the board of directors of a major knife company, and then Swiss Army Swiss, was it Swiss Army? Yeah. And then what? He was in a limo one time. You were telling well, me the story. This is just three days before the murders. He's back in Connecticut. He's on a board of this. Uh, this I'm trying to think of the uh, name of the, the uh, company. Cato thinks it was Swiss Army. It was either that one or They something. handled Swiss Army knives, but it wasn't oh, the... Uh, oh, it was the... Uh, I, I don't... He was in the board of like 12 companies. They all got dropped. I remember, I remember certain yeah. ones like Honey Baked Ham and... Uh, but this, but I don't know the knife company. Well, this one, I, I don't... Escapes me. It's in the book. But anyway, uh, he was back there this three days before at the board of directors. They, had a, they played golf, of course. And he had a limo pick him up and take him to the airport after the, the conference was over. And on the way to the airport, they gave him a bag full of knives and wristwatches. And he was in the back of the limo, and the limo driver's talking with him back and forth, and he's looking at the rearview mirror not the, uh, from the back. And Simpson is going through the bags, and he pulls out a long-bladed knife, and he's looking at it and said, certainly admiring it like this. And the limo driver sees this through the mirror, and Simpson says something to the effect that... Uh, Man, this is really sure they really kill somebody, this type of thing. And the limo driver is picking up on this, and then he says, you know, would you like one of these knives? Because they have a whole bunch of them there. And he says, no, I just don't have a wristwatch. So Simpson gave him a wristwatch. We get this story when he calls in. And any high-profile case, you're going to have a lot of BS, okay? A lot of people calling in. I saw this. It's all nonsense. doesn't mean you, you can't go. You have to go through every one of these things. Right. So I sent one of our detectives back to Connecticut to interview this guy. And not only to interview the, the dilemma driver, not just to interview him, but to give him a polygraph. And he did, and this guy passed with flying colors. Mm -hmm. So would you want to have that guy as a witness? I think I would. Yeah. Now, this doesn't say, this isn't direct, any kind of direct evidence to, that uh, he's a murderer. But, I mean, these things build. And in this case, <clears throat> there are literally dozens of these little circumstantial incidents that occurred that add up. You never have too much evidence in a murder case. You want to put all this stuff on, but this is stuff that the cops did, and you don't want the cops to look too good. Mr. Mr. and Ms. Prosecution, you don't want that to happen because you're not going to get your verdict. And if you want to play that game, the prosecution, you don't want to put the cops on to put evidence on, tell the cops that right. so they know what's going on. Right, that was one of your beefs, right, that well, they yeah. never kept you in the loop. It might have been the smart way to go. We'll go the DNA only. Listen, there's plenty of DNA and blood and everything else for anybody to get convicted of that case. Mm -hmm. you, again, you never have too much evidence, so you don't deliberately keep, hold it back. If that's your, if that's your strategy, good. Mm -hmm. Share it with your investigators. We now work for you. Also, uh, you guys were aware that I think you just did a pilot, uh, Navy SEALs. Yeah. Where I, you did you guys have to investigate it on set or anything and and forms of uh, knives on that show and we did all I, that we we did, did all those types I, of things but frankly that was not uh, one of the top things in the consideration yeah, yeah. I can understand not putting that on it's a little maybe a little too much Hollywood glitz right uh, they're but trying to overdo it remember this is a televised thing which was another mistake. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But it's a lot of coincidences, uh, coincidences yeah. that add up to yeah. a lot of circumstances. But it makes us, makes the job tougher too, because it's like, oh, we can't really go into this thing now with because yeah. we got to look at the blood, or we got to look at this other uh, interview of someone that saw the Bronco at this hour, and you got to you got to check every and your your day must maybe you don't sleep from that time. You you must had hours that were, I, I imagine at least sixteen hour days. Yeah, there was a lot oh. part of the deal. If you don't want it, then you do something else. Right. And then the drive back to Simi Valley. Well, yeah. Which probably you needed. Get your mind off things. Get out of yeah. get out of L.A. This, clear your head for a little bit. This case, though, I know it's got a lot of publicity and everything else. Yeah. Isn't in the top ten as far as difficulty, as far as time spent. Okay. Because there was nothing exculpatory in this case. Most murder cases have something exculpatory. Something that says, well, maybe he didn't do it because you get this and yeah. It's very rare. Everything was inculpatory in this case towards Simpson. By the way, that's a great little plug for the new book that you're finishing up yes. called The Dirty Business of Murder, where you're going to get into multiple 
serial killer cases, right. the Wonderland murders that you were involved in directly. I mean, Tom's career is one of one. It's on, I have so much respect for you, Tom, and, and just the way you've just handled yourself in the media all these years, all the um, documentaries you're on, you're so entertaining. You have amazing recall and just this stability and, you know, just sense of order about you that's comforting. And, you know, it's it's amazing. And then, and then just being able to share these stories again. So we really appreciate you being here. You know, Cato, you mentioned uh, Swiss Army. They also make watches. So it might have been them, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. so. I, I don't, I think it was, but yeah. uh, whatever, then we can check that out. Yeah. Uh, you know, Tom also wrote Evidence Dismissed. And the biggest part of the trial was all these things that yeah. were dismissed that could have been slam dunks, I'm sure. And I imagine that you have to go, you went into Marsha Clark and just said, look at what we have. And your reaction when she goes, we're not going to use it, we're not going to use it, we're not going to use it, you're pissed off, aren't you? I am, but <clears throat> you don't want to get pissed off in a high-profile case with your prosecutor and vice versa. Um, if she'd have shared a few things with us, perhaps it wouldn't have been as bad. But it's not just that she didn't use these things. She lied about one in particular, which was the fellow at the airport. Yeah. Yeah. That was corroborated when we did a, a show together a couple of years ago right. with Alan Park, a right. limo driver, who saw the same things that this witness saw at the airport, and that is O.J. standing right next to a trash container with a little half moon-shaped travel bag that you're familiar with right. that you went to grab on the driveway when he was going to the airport, and he didn't want you anywhere near it, and he grabbed it. Well... Fast forward 30 minutes ahead to LAX, American Airlines, that That's... little bag is on the top of a trash container. He's reaching in, Simpson's reaching into the bag, taking items out and stuffing them into this trash container. That's... Not only did this witness tell me that six months after the trial began, <clears throat> but Alan Park tells me he saw the guy and he saw Simpson standing by the trash container during the show that we did. And I said, did you tell this to Marsha? And he says, yeah, I told her all about it. Well, when I asked Marcia back at the time of the trial, she denied it. She says, we've got nobody to corroborate what he says. That was a flat, flat lie. Right. You can't do that to that, your investigator. And that's what pissed you off the most. Well, yes. That, because well, then that, the cat was out of the bag that she's not communicating with you. Rest, she's got her own rest. agenda. What's yeah. fascinating is that I, I went to, I was closest to this thing. I'll get it for you. And he said, no, no, don't get it. Uh -huh. And that well, is the bag that uh, someone well, saw. We don't know. Put. We haven't seen we, the yeah, bag. We well, the knife yeah. never showed up, so if well, he was not adamant about dumping something. Well, this is nine months later we find out about this. And, of course, there's three pickups to two common landfills in L.A. It goes from LAX. There's nothing we can do to find us. That bag never shows up. We went all the way back to Chicago to the hotel and searched for that bag. The bag never showed up again. Well, you tell me it was in the bag. We haven't found the knife. We haven't found the shoes. haven't found the clothing. Who was in the bag? That one's unbelievable. And, and, and think about it. He, he thinks he can probably out-talk or outsmart anybody, but there's a lot of quick decisions you have to make as a murderer. And a lot of them are pretty bad, I would imagine. He, uh, well, the, he had to get rid of that weapon. The obvious mistakes are what we've discussed. Mm -hmm. They always screw up. You just got to find out how, and then you have to find out what is and try to corroborate it. And that's what was done in this case. And again, everything is inculpatory. It all goes right, even the shoe size. Uh, we don't have the shoes, but we know what size he wore because he told me. Yeah. And you took the Reeboks out of his house. Uh, he had the shoes that he said he was wearing the night of the murder. He lied. Mm -hmm. We're size 12. That's what we have at the scene, size 12, bloody footwear impressions from the uh, the Bruno Mollies. And uh, that's why I took them to begin with. They weren't the shoes he was wearing. But he just, if, if, if those were size 10, that's exculpatory evidence. That if, if I'm on the jury, that's good enough for me to say, I don't think he did it. We had none of that, none of that. And the DA was well aware of that. And none of that stuff was put on because the cops did it and the cops are on trial. Simple well, as that. Yeah. Speaking of cops on trial, <clears throat> do you, in your daily uh, uh, work day, do you, did you see Vanetta, Furman, and Phillips all the time? Because I was going to bring up Mark Furman. Did you have contact with him? And did you know that he was going to plead the fifth? And did you know that Johnny Cochran was going to go with that race card? We suspicioned that. Now, the Furman thing, I was in trial, I was in the, in the trial every single day, mm -hmm. and I was there in Furman. We were on Furman's side. We backed him up initially. Just before he went on the stand, I said, Mark, I'm going to be in the first row. When they start screwing with you, I want you to look at me and know that we're behind you. We're backing you up. Wow. Well, that turned around <laughs> once he opened his mouth. <laughs> it was one of these. You know, it's them. Uh, oh. 
that really flipped us off. And then when you get right down to it, uh, and he's asked, did you at this case or any other case ever plan evidence in a murder case, and you plead the fifth? Game's over. I don't care what you talk about evidence. If you're in a jury, you can't convict because he may have done that. Who knows? He did not plant evidence. Phil Van Adder did not plant blood evidence, as uh, uh, Alan Dershowitz to this day says, and no one ever confronts Alan Dershowitz with his lies. There's never been any evidence that any blood was planted by either Furman, Van Adder, me, or anybody else. If there were, you'd have seen that by now. It's 30 years ago. It would have been in, in, admitted into evidence by the defense. That never, ever happened. Yet to this day, he lies about this for whatever reason, and nobody ever confronts him. Including last week when he was on Fox yeah, was, commenting about O.J.'s death, yeah. which has got to really gall you. Let's go back to the timeline after the murder. So what day was it where he was considered a suspect? Was that Wednesday? Well, I can't give you a day. It's just these things have a tendency to build, but you, you, you can't wrap yourself up in, in, you know, sure tunnel vision. You can't do that. You got to wait till everything is in, but you document things thoroughly. And you don't start making a, a suppositions. A lot of investigators, young ones especially, rely on supposition. Well, one and one is two because two and two is four. So they say, no, you've got to prove what you're saying before you can even talk about it. You document everything and eventually you're going to have time to sit down and look what you have. Mm -hmm. So you, once you thoroughly document, then you make your decisions. What's exculpatory? Any investigator on a murder case, the first thing they want to do is look for exculpatory evidence. Once you know what your problem is, you can, it's, it's going to help you solve this case and put it together. You know what the problems are, and you're going to deal with those problems. We kept looking here. here. There's nothing exculpatory of a substantive nature. So what, I'm, I'm just trying to lead up to Friday, the 17th, the day of the chase. Yeah. It was, at what point was he considered a suspect? Was it the night before? Because he had made the agreement to, to turn himself in the next morning to Parker Center uh, on well, the, that Friday morning, and he didn't show up. Well, he had a warrant for his arrest. Mm -hmm. And Phil and I, is what we like to do is we go out. I, we don't want the media around, obviously. The brass head has different considerations, okay? Uh, we work for somebody. We have to do as we're told. So they wanted him to show up. We didn't want to do that. We wanted to just drive out to the Kardashian's house, pick him up, no fuss, no mess, no problems, no 12 helicopters following you around or anything else. Bring him in, book him, it's all over. No, somebody's got to have a show. And so you saw what happened when somebody had to have a show. We ended up on the freeway for a couple hours. That was the problem. When you work with a bureaucracy, you're going to deal with that. You, you don't have a choice. Was that the, was the day? Was that the day the suicide note that was read? Was that the chase day? Or was that yeah? The no, day it, was, it was the no, it was the day. It was Friday the seventeenth. Just before the chase was revealed. So no one knew yet. The note was read. Then the he was. Uh, uh, I, I the, what was the fugitive? Term they used? Fugitive. Yeah. He is now a fugitive yeah. of, of the law. When Gil Garcetti said that, so and no, then, actually, I think the uh, chief of police did. Okay, and I then think. and then the chase starts from Orange County, and they pick him up. Yeah, uh, Tom, and then obviously that was you know you were front and center for that thing. Talk about how you communicated with him. How did you get a hold of him? Why were did you volunteer to do that? Well. Uh, it's kind of what we did. I mean, somebody's got to make a decision. <laughs> what happened was was that we knew he'd, he'd split, okay? We're in our squad bay with everybody, and up in the corner there's a television set. And we're thinking about where could he have gone once we found out he didn't show up. He wasn't at Kardashian's house. I sent a couple of black and whites to Kardashian's house in Encino to search the house and see what was going on. That's how we found out what was going on there. And they just said, yeah, he just took off with AC. We don't know where he went. He didn't see or anything else. So we're trying to find out where he is. Sooner or later, somebody's going to see him. I figure that. And all of a sudden, somebody yells. He said, hey, it's OJ. He's on the TV. He's going to look up, and there's the Bronco going on the freeway. And I'm looking. I said, oh, God, this is going to be a mess. <clears throat> right in the middle of it, people are looking at me there, thinking, uh, well, somebody's got to make a decision about something to do. Well, nobody's going to do that when it's your case. <laughs> They don't want anything to do with this because everybody's watching this yeah. stuff. So I'm waiting for the chief to come over. Well, chief, eventually, a couple other chiefs show up down there, and nobody is doing anything. Well, I'm not that type of a person. I've never been that type of a person. I'm going to do something. 
I learned this in Vietnam under some very bad circumstances. You make a decision or you're not going to walk out of here. Mm -hmm. I made a decision. I'm going to get a hold of him. We just happened to have his phone number. We had uh, a lady at the, uh, in the office who had all the phone numbers. Uh, Patty Fairbanks? Patty. Called her up. She said, yeah, here's the number. He's got a mobile number. So I'm thinking, well, at least I'm doing something. I'm going to try to call him. What I'm going to tell, let's tell him or say, I have no idea. I just need him on the phone because now he's got a gun. If I can talk to him about anything, he's not going to shoot himself. He's not going to shoot AC. He's not going to shoot at the cops. If he shoots at the cops or one of those idiots that's running up to the car banging on the side, we're going to have more of a problem. If I can entertain him talking about the gun, the gun only, maybe we can get him home and he won't use it. That was my only purpose. Mm. But I said he's not going to even pick up. Well, he picked up. The rest is history. Uh, a lot of people say that you talked him out of committing suicide. Do you think he was serious about killing himself, or do you think he was so much of a narcissist and a sociopath that it was all for show? How about both? <laughs> yeah. The reason I said that was because he, he hadn't slept over a day. He was under the influence of, uh, I think it was just grass when we did, wow. we did some testing. He, just, he was under the influence, and, and you could tell from his moaning and this and then the other. That wasn't an act. He's very tired. I don't think he knew what he wanted to do. We find out later he went down into Cole's grave with A.C. A.C. thought he was going to kill himself. But then he came back, and then they decided to go. I don't think Simpson knew what he wanted to do at the time, quite frankly. Would he have done this? I don't know. Cato, were you watching the chase? Yeah, I was watching the uh, chase at um, a few of my buddies' uh, place, and um, I, I was amazed myself that there was just line lineup of people with the signs up, uh, you know, juice on the loose, and, uh, and just how— my feelings were like, there, I think this is the wrong thing. I didn't know anything that's going on yet. But I got out of the house em pretty much immediately uh, after the time OJ pulled me into the kitchen area and said, well, you know I was in here eating with you. And then I was, no, you weren't. And that was another part where I said, why is he lying to me? No. And is he trying to make me say something that's going to be in the, the trials, one of the questions? And it was just a... I think it protect him to give him an alibi. Then they so. made you a hostile witness. Yeah. That didn't help. Why would you do that? He's right in the middle of this, and he's a hostile witness. Now you really have a hostile witness. Cato's only yeah. hostile when he's commenting about the Brewers on X. <laughs> then you're pretty hostile. Or if the Packers lose, watch out. He's hey, hostile. Hey, there. Hey, listen, he's from Milwaukee. He understands. Big Packers fan. He yeah. knows Milwaukee. He knows yeah. Wisconsin. Hey, by the way, you're watching One Degree of Scandalous. If you're new to the channel, thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody that watched the episode last week with Cato and I. So subscribe to the channel. And, and go back, because Zoe Turr was the videographer and helicopter pilot for CBS here in L.A., who picked up O.J.'s Bronco first from, OJ, or from Orange County. So she owned that story for 20 minutes or so. So we have the yeah. whole backstory of that. And then another great episode to listen to is the one with Jill Shively, who was driving down via... Uh, Somewhere in Brentwood, she was driving Barrington, Barrington, right around 10 o'clock or around that time, 9, 30, 10, whatever it was. And according to her, OJ had just left the crime scene and came flying by her and almost ran her off the road. That's another fascinating Which she podcast. talked to a Tom and immediately knew the license plate and that. And we also have Conan Nolan. Yeah, the NBC reporter, reporter who was have, sitting in the back of a car filming OJ chance. from the front. The just only angle that he had. In a, in a, like a carpenter's van or something, because he couldn't get a, yeah. a NBC van. It's the stories that are just, all these connections to it are just amazing. It never but, used. but the Jill Shively yeah. story still amazes me. Yeah. And, and um, uh, we talked, she's obviously very legitimate and she was just another witness they never used. Yeah, uh, she was, uh, she sold her story, hard copy I think it was. I understand that, it looks bad. Sometimes you, it's the old shit sandwich. You got to take a bite and move on. And that's what it was. Why not put her on? It's, it's evidence. If I thought she was lying, I wouldn't have put her on. She wasn't lying. The, the thing was she was going to the Westwood Home Market. It was around 11. It closed at 11, so she was in a hurry to get there. I mean, all these things fit together, so her story was legitimate. So you put her on. We had her in studio. Yeah, she's extremely she's believable. Okay. Well, she's yeah. a great oh, person. Yeah. Well, be believable yeah. because she's not lying. She's just uh, you know telling the truth of the story. And, and she would to enhance her story from what you told you told you guys and what she told us. 
They're enhancing their story. They're building on it. Yeah, then maybe there's this didn't happen. But she was consistent. You put her on. Yeah. When did uh, when did frustration turn to anger for you as this thing mounted and you realized that really it was LAPD that was on trial here and it was your supposed ally, Marsha Clark, that was putting you guys on trial? Were all this incredible evidence that you had, if you stacked it up, your great, great quote is it could have been a 10-minute Columbo episode oh. and five minutes of commercials probably. But when did it – is that just part of the job where you just got to deal with it or were you really getting ticked off? Well, I, you're ticked off, but you got to keep, keep things under control. You don't want to lose control. Uh, wow. When you really get ticked off is you don't know why. But I disagreed if she said, listen, Phil, Tom, this is what we're going to have to do. You know you guys, they hate you. They hate all the cops. You weren't, they didn't have anything to do with Rodney King, but you're L.A. cops. And you're on trial. You kind of know that. So I'm going to have to play a couple of games here, okay? So I just want you to know, don't take it personally. And then she said, I'm going to go the DA, uh, the DNA. The DNA in this case was enough to convict anybody 10 times over. We all know that. I would have said, well, I think you should probably put everything on. If it's a murder case, all the little circumstantial things, there's nothing exculpatory. This is all good stuff. I probably would have had a problem, but I would have understand her thinking. When you don't tell me about it and then later you lie about it, that really ticks you off. But then again, you have to keep under control. You can't blow it. How about the two of you, Cato? Did the relationship develop at all or not really until after the trial and everything had passed? Or did you have a lot of interaction with Tom? Well, I, I interviewed with Tom. I, it, I was down there at least six times, I'd say. Yeah. I talked to you. And um, I, I, I was pretty much open to talk to anybody there. I talked to Marsha Clark over and over. I went down to that office. And uh, the part of it, I don't know if people understand this. I never, I, I said to the shows before, I've never been in a courtroom in my life. I never had to take yeah. nothing. So I didn't know when they give you sort of a, a review of what they're going to ask you. Sure. And uh, I would follow her and I was, I was on her team. I was her witness. I was a sure. prosecution witness. So I was thrown in sort of a curve and I had that, as everybody knows, the deer in the headlight looks because mm -hmm. I didn't remember things. I go, that wasn't part of the review. So if I'm on, that you don't realize that it's a camera. So I mean, it's catching you, but you're made me look like a fool. So, uh, but I was there. I was, I was trying to remember, and that's why I took my time and answering anything to make sure that I was answering correctly. One of the low lights of the trial was when they declared you a hostile witness. That was ridiculous. Explain it to everybody else. Though. I still. Yeah, now to... he's my witness. I called him and all, but I don't believe anything he's going to say. Okay. <laughs> you got a lot of airtime for that. Yeah, the hostile witness that Man, she we did. Talked she to you. did it like we, on we... day six, I think, five or six. Let's put it like this. I wouldn't be here today talking to you and Tom if I didn't have some respect for you and the way you handled yourself. You did uh, not do a bad job. You well, did not. Thank you. You did a very normal job. That would be expected. If you did anything other than what you did, then there's something wrong. But you did not screw this up. She screwed it up by initially saying you're some kind of a hostile witness. And right away, if he's hostile, that means we can't believe anything he says. I say shame yeah. on anybody that tries to <clears throat> judge either of you with the immense pressure that you were under testifying for eight days, testifying for the better part of the week and just, you know, knowing the, you know, taking it from both sides, right? You expect it from the defense, no. but when the prosecution isn't really in your, your friend, that it just makes it a hundred times worse. Well, you don't have to be friends here. You yeah. just have to use a little common sense. Mm -hmm. And they, we were now, we worked for the DA now. We are her witnesses and her investigators. Yeah. And then when all this is over and the books start to come out, she starts bad mouthing us about the interview, calling it an interrogation, all this other crap, which it was not, uh, and all these negative things in defense of herself, in defense of her own nonsense. You know, Tom's had a good second career just dealing with the evidence that wasn't used, TV shows, books, bestseller, evidence dismissed. You could still get that, order that book. It's a great book. He's working on a new one that ties in, man, so many stories from these famous serial killer cases and just all sorts of murders, domestic violence, you name it, it's in there. Um, I just find it f so fascinating that, you know, LAPD is huge. What, there's 70,000 mm -hmm. cops, or there used to be. There were about 6,800 when I was uh, okay. They went up to 10,000. 10,000, okay, I got my number off a little bit. Two, there's about okay. 8,000. I moved now. the comma. <laughs> okay, but there's a lot. How does somebody get to the level that you are, that – you know, at the peak of your career, where you were so good, and you were in the middle of all these cases. Hillside Strangler, Night Stalker, Wonderland Murders, OJ. Well, at Hillside, I didn't work, but I, my unit did. We were part, we have, it's not just me. <laughs> we, yeah. We've got, you know, 16 guys working, named gals, 
uh, working all of these cases, most of them with other agencies, the L.A. sheriffs and Guardian and other places, too. The way you get there, it's like anything, like what you do. Uh, you're probably pretty good at what you do because you like what you do. You want to do what you do. Mm -hmm. In life, if you like something, you really like it, you're going to want to want to be good at it. You're going to be damn good at it. So I started going to crime scenes, working juvenile in, in central downtown. Because we worked at night, we would roll on the murder cases. And so I would go and ask a lot of questions. I've seen a lot of death before I came out of the police department in the Marine Corps. I don't get into any of that right now. I don't have to. But it always fascinated me. How does this happen? Why does this happen? Mm -hmm. And it's a challenge. It's the challenge. And the other thing is, if you work in homicide, most people don't want anything to do with it because they don't know anything about it. They don't want to know anything about it. They don't want any part of it. Leave me alone just to do my job. You can't be that way. You can't be a bread and butter cop nine to five. You're going to work long hours and you got to care about what you do. More importantly than care, you got to respect what you do. If you don't respect what you do, you're going to suck at it. You got to really want to do it and you're going to like it and you're going to be good at it. Yeah. And for both of you, the support Wait. of your family had to help a lot too. Oh, 100%. Because you, you bring that home, you know, when you go home to oh, my wife been through a whole lot more than I have. Mm -hmm. I right. know yeah, my wife. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, she's she's amazing. a whole lot more. Okay. Right. And the hours that you keep. Uh, a question for you, Tom. And, uh, you're retired now. But when you see, when you watch TV and you see, uh, I'll give an example, the uh, Idaho, the college murders of this, I think his name is Brian Kohlberger, is, a, is a supposedly uh, up for trial as possibly the, the number one suspect. Do you form an opinion or do you, would, if you thought of something, would they, would you make the call? Do they take your call? Are you familiar with that case? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and uh, so... I mean, opinions of that, do you ever get involved from, you know, sort of a, our you know, armchair quarterback when you're seeing what's going on? Well, do you go, have you guys checked this out? Have you guys done this? I'm curious, like anybody else would be. Right. But I know the setup and I know how they did it. And that particular case really doesn't have anybody else they're even looking at. And again, when all else fails, you go with the evidence. The fact that he fled... And the evidence that I've seen it tells me he's probably the suspect. But I would like to see everything mm -hmm. because hopefully the prosecution in that case have, has held back some things. They've had to turn it over for discovery to the defense, obviously. But you don't want to throw everything out, especially in a high profile case, because it'll get watered down. There'll be 100 people that'll go after it. And by the time you get testimony on it, it's been all watered down. Right. It's not going to help your case. So I hold back on stuff until I get all the evidence. But he looks to me like a pretty good suspect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that, then when that trial and, starts, that's going to be the next big one. Well, and also I think the hardest thing, Tom, would be uh, both times. The hardest thing has got to be that when, when there's something that's fresh in the news that goes out, who handles all the claws and they have these tip lines? It's got to be insane that that would ruin some man hours because you got to follow up on everything. Everybody. No matter, And it's it, it can really take away from the focus of what's, you know, you know, you, you got to follow up if someone says, hey, I know this guy. So you follow up and you go, oh, we just wasted three hours. This guy's just wanted to just talk to people. Well, we we categorize these. Mm -hmm. And I think I showed you the charts when you did that last show. <clears throat> you were at number three, by the way. <clears throat> all right. That means you weren't all that important. <laughs> you know, we weren't Kittle looking at you. not that's, bad, man. That's, that's good, though. That's good not to be a number one. Then. By the way, if you knew at the time you were number three, you could have been a little bit more worried. I always tell people. <laughs> that's pretty close to one. Yeah. Be, be, well, we watch out for number one, but be careful not to step at number two. I think yes. you shared that with yes. me. <laughs> hey, you're watching no. One Degree of Scandalous with Cato Kalen and Tom Zender. This hour has flown by with legendary detective Tom wow. Lang of LAPD. If you like this, if you like the show, like what Cato and Tom are bringing you today, we're here every single week. Cato and I. So like the channel, uh, subscribe to the channel so you get the alerts when the new episodes are out every single Thursday. So this is what we do. Um, wrapping it up real quickly because I tease this. Two pieces of evidence. He did buy a disguise, right, a few weeks before. And then what, what happened when you disassembled the Bronco, when you took the white Bronco apart? Okay, but the uh, disguise kit, yes, purchased about three weeks before he did use it. Why else would you purchase a disguise kit? I don't know. We might have seen that in court as evidence. We didn't. We took the Bronco apart, took the console out, took the doors off, windshields out, completely stripped the car down. We luminoled it for looking for blood, uh, these types of things. And when they took out the passenger seat, I saw a little bulb, a little illumination bulb rolling around out of the passenger seat. And I think, boy, that looks like the little bulb that belongs up top. 
And I looked up, and the bulb was missing. We find out that that little bulb belongs up there. So how did it get underneath the seat? When I was a young cop in Hollywood in the 60s, first thing we did when we got into a police car is we checked to see if that little bulb was up there because back then they didn't have what today what they call cutoff switches. Yeah, If you wanted that thing, you had to take the bulb out if you didn't want it to be lit up when you opened the door. We'd always take the bulb out. What do we throw it underneath the seat? So who took the bulb out? Turns out it was the bulb that fit up there. It was a serviceable bulb. Now we printed it and there's no prints. Well, what is he doing with, with it underneath his seat? Could it be that this individual, the suspect, because he drove into a very dark alley and killed somebody? And if he hadn't taken that bulb out, he would have been illuminated? Very circumstantial, doesn't mean he's a killer, but that and 15 or 20 other things begin to add up. Yeah, and he had gloves with him, so wow. there would be no prints on the bulb. That yeah. just makes sense. Wrap it up, Cato. Anything? I, you know, I th you, obviously we can go on forever and just with so many clues. I just think uh, people out there should ev get ev evidence dismissed. You work uh, also with another writer. And Michael Conley. Michael Conley. Legendary And novel. it's just, uh, yeah. you know, uh, obviously, Tom Lang, you are the real deal. I'm glad to be your friend. I'm, I, I, who would have known that 30 years later we are still here <laughs> together? And, and yeah, um, Still kicking. Still, well, kicking, but just... That we still are in contact, and uh, I'm mm. I'm honored. I really am. I, I mean, appreciate it. that. Thank you. And Good let me add. Here. Let me add too that the uh, the public is still fascinated by the two of you and the story and just your ability to tell it and the fact that you own it. You know that you do share it because people are fascinated, and you two are the the closest witnesses to it. And it's just been unbelievable, compelling conversation. By the way, Cato, I owe you a personal thanks because I went out to pick up Tom today. I, if I could spend an hour with him in the car, I'm going to do it. I'm such a fan of Tom Lang. And you said, you're not taking your daughter's car, are you? Uh, my daughter has a Bronco. My 18-year-old <laughs> daughter. So I left that one at home. Thank you for that advice. Yes. <laughs> yes. And thank, thank you guys for ordering from Vons. I appreciate hey, thank that. Thank you for bringing the food for us. And Tom, thank you. You're welcome here anytime, especially to talk about that new book of yours and where you can get into some of the serial right. killers. Let me just leave you with this, everybody. Tom told me that there are hundreds of serial killers in the United States and Los Angeles alone. Like... Dozens and dozens in L.A. that we don't even know about, including women serial well, killers. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we got to get you back in here if you want to do it again. But but thank you. That's all we can say. Thank you so much. My pleasure. All right. And I want to get that book. Yeah. Yeah. Order the book. Evidence Dismissed, Tom Lang's bestseller from the late 90s and his new one, which will be coming out soon. And we'll keep you updated on that. So just follow Cato and I on social media. Make sure you subscribe to the channel here. And uh, I don't know how we top this, but we'll try next week. Thank you, Tom. For Tom Lang yeah. and Cato Kalin, I'm Tom Zenner. Thanks for watching One Degree of Scandalous with Tom Zenner and Cato Kalin. Subscribe to the channel, and we will catch you next week. Thanks for watching.